The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the final movement of Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra, the Obligato Recitative. You might notice that I fixed this somewhat. In the manuscript from which I'm taking these images, it says the obligatory recitative, and that's not really what is meant there. It's not like obligatory. Schoenberg originally wanted to name this movement the Endless Recitative. In other words, it was a recitative that went through the entire piece, just trading off from one instrument to the other. But he was afraid of being associated with the concept of endless melody from Wagner very much not a Wagnerian at this point. And also his publisher, I think, felt that that was a weak term to use. So he went for the term obligato in the sense of being very thoroughly worked out, right? He wanted to let the reader know, the listener know, that he had really carefully worked out the recitative all the way through and that it was very carefully constructed. And in fact, the structure is something that is endlessly discussed. I could spend five hours going through all the intricacies of how all the different parts are used, how they are repeated, how they are reflected, and there are all kinds of neat little things. For instance, certain rhythmic motives that are repeated throughout the recitative and the accompanying parts and I feel that that would just be totally boring. And in fact, I was originally going to make this into three separate lectures, but I feel just for a few different circumstances, one is just the big crisis that the world is facing right now. As I am narrating this lecture, we are all kind of hunkered down in our separate little houses waiting for the threat of infection to lessen across the population of the world and I have a lot of viewers out there who are more than ready to dig into a new set of lectures. So that is one reason I'm going to wrap this up. And then another is that I feel that this music is just so polyphonic that it almost goes beyond my capacity in the style of lecturing that I do to really cover everything that needs to be covered. I would just be endlessly picking this apart, you know, just like a, a really difficult knot on every single page. So instead, what I'm going to do with this is give you something of an overview of this last movement. And you can do the remainder of the analysis yourself. There are some great resources online. Just plug in Schoenberg's Five Pieces for Orchestra Analysis Movement 5 and you'll come up with a few good resources. And then there are more. There are some books out there too. So bear with me. I wish that this could be more detailed, but just the structure of the piece and the circumstances of my life right now are such that it is just really better to give you an overview. And I feel that that's sufficient too because this music is almost built to defy easy description, right? So attempting to give it easy description really goes against what it is there for. But I will point out certain things, doublings and interesting combinations of color. And of course, we will discuss where that recitative is going, right? In other words, in this case, the Hauptstimme, right? The head voice. So, on this page, really most of the responsibility for the Hauptstimme, for the recitative, is shared between the violins and the clarinets. 
Of course, other instruments chime in from time to time. Isn't it interesting how one instrument will have the Hauptstimme, and then they will just finish up their phrasing on a note that isn't part of the Hauptstimme, right? So you can't always be sure <clears throat> that everything is included. Everything inside the brackets is all that you really need to know, right? And in terms of assigning where the Hauptstimme is or tracking it throughout the piece. So if we were just to look at the winds, we would see we're starting off with second clarinet, jumping up to oboes. Notice that there is a overlap, right? The second clarinet plays these first two notes and the oboe comes in just overlapping right over that same beat and then carrying it on. Then the first takes over, plays for a little while, and at this point it just jumps to the violins completely. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, right in here, there is no Hauptstimme marking, but I sort of feel that it is really still second clarinet right in there, or possibly bass clarinet. Then we come back in right here. Hauptstimme for first clarinet goes on for quite a bit, actually. And then gets traded off to the cellos, and then ends up with the first horn muted. Okay, so that is the first screen's recitative line, at least as far as the winds and the brass are concerned. Now here we see that the strings actually have a much more imaginative role than the winds. Right, we've got this portamento sliding down here to a D natural from a D sharp going off of this note once again overlapping right so the D sharp is going to continue on with both oboes while the violas take a dive then here we've got this push right here with the first violins which I think is so cool it's just inflating this one clarinet note here the first violins take over on this, and it's really hard to make this line speak. In the recording we'll be using, they don't really pop out of the texture as much as they could have. Here I feel that the role of the second violins is to reinforce those essential notes in the first violin, and they're just really not doing that big of a job, but that's just the way that that orchestra felt like balancing it, or that conductor. Uh, felt like balancing it. Now here, on this exact same note, written B, right, we have the same note here in tenor clef cello, continues on, right, and then at this point we hear this dive down here, and this actually takes some attention away from that Hauptstimme line, and is almost its own little secondary thing. We could call this Nebenstimme right in here. Okay, and here is where I feel the second clarinet comes in and is possibly carrying on the Hauptstimme, or you could also think of maybe the flutes, right? Because you can see we've got piano crescendo right in here. And we also have bass clarinet, remember I mentioned bass clarinet before, as possibly carrying on that Hauptstimme, because notice if we think of this as a secondary recitative line, this lovely Divisi cello dipping down to that B. This is the same note here in bass clarinet, right? So I actually think this is more like Nebenstimme. This is sort of like a supporting main line. And the real Hauptstimme would either be the second clarinet or the flutes, actually possibly even more the flute because the flute is closer in pitch to this little B flat ending right in here. All right, so B flat A, right? Going to this G. And then right in here, we've got F sharp taking over from the G. All right, so I just feel that maybe there was a Hauptstimme marking missing here from our flutes. I, I don't know which one this is, flutes one, two, and three. And right here is the page break, right? So I should have marked which one this is. It's probably first flute. So anyhow, continuing on, <laughs> right? We don't have any support from the strings. 
right in here. But that's cool because right in here we have, once again, cellos. And just kind of continuing this on until it can be picked up by our horns right here, right? So uh, reading A, right, that is actually a concert D, which is not too far away from this note right in here, right, which is in tenor clef, think of your reading, which is a C sharp, right? So this is just jumping down a seventh to this concert D right in here. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how all that is supported. <laughs> okay, um, I really like this idea of sforzando, piano, tuba, and third trombone, kind of coming in here very sharp with this D fifth and then G sixth, right? And just a little bit of Nebenstimme right in here or contrary motion. It's very polyphonic, right? In here in the first trumpet, right? Just kind of playing off of that legato. And, you know, even a little bit of pickup line right in here with the second horn. Right, and then playing these low notes right in here, which are doubled beautifully by the double basses. Once again, this is just a grab bag of great ideas. And that is one right in there. I would say, like, if you're just to take away one thing, that would be it. And that is that the double basses can double the low horns, or even one low horn. And it can sound beautiful. Legato. That's going to work great with these uh, double basses. And then Arco, we've got this little line coming in here, kind of Nebenstimme, once again, right? This arcing over what's going and below the Hauptstimme of the clarinets. I could just point out all of these really cool features all day. But notice how there's a bit of anticipatory scoring, right? So this little idea in here is somewhat similar, especially when you add the second oboe into the mix, of what is about to happen right in here. It kind of sets up where the Hauptstimme is going to go, and in fact, this is one reason why this piece should be so carefully balanced by the conductor, because if this line pops out too much, then it will distract attention while the first clarinet is holding this nice, gorgeous, high written C, and then the audience's ear will not be directed to the actual Hauptstimme here, right? So that is really, really an important facet, uh, the balancing that we've got. All right, let's jump ahead a little bit. Uh, I really love these violas right in here, and the way that this all works out. Once again, really, really cool doublings. Second horn with double basses again. And then right in here, we've got second violins with the clarinets. And that is also a beautiful doubling. I love this concert F, written C, just sort of pushing through the fabric right there. Very, very cool, especially when you consider it coming over these violas which are playing this uh, low D right in here. So that, that is just just awesome. And then right in here, he says echo, right? He just wants a just a very, very soft sound here from first and second trombones and first trumpet. Intensely soft and also adding a little bit of flute. And this is a case where you can double this low flute with the trumpet and if they're really paying attention and really soft then it will work right it will not work at any other dynamic really you know you go up to mezzo forte and you lose the flute but right in here this is a little lesson for everybody who wants to work on their transposition reading here you're seeing the instruments in C the two bassoons and the divisi cellos and they are being doubled by bass clarinet. Obviously, it's all the same notes, right? And you can just see it's up a ninth, right? This A is the same as this B natural and so on. So it's, you know, that is just really how you would write a bass clarinet part, uh, especially doubling a C part, right? So that is just the most vague 
way of describing how this page is put together. Okay, and I know I'm going to have to even speed things up more than that if I want to get through this whole lecture without breaking it up into separate little packets. So let's move on to the next screen. Here we have a continuation of that doubling, right? We've got a little bit of clarinet, bass clarinet, bassoons, cellos, right? And as they swoop up, clarinets come back in. See, it's whatever pitch the clarinet can play. Schoenberg isn't fussy about that. He's not obsessed with the exact tone here. He just wants the sense of clarinets to take over, and he doesn't want the bassoons to reach way, way high up, right? He just wants this to be mostly a clarinet sound, right? and it's actually not that far of a reach for the bassoons. He just doesn't want the quality of this right in here to be bassoon-like. He wants to wait till right here. Uh, written D-sharp for bass clarinet is actually middle C-sharp for bassoon, so obviously it's not that big of a reach. It's just, once again, the quality of the timbre, right? And then right in here, he really wants to push it with all of these instruments, all five instruments, right? We've got um, our two clarinets, bass clarinet, and both bassoons reaching way up here. And it's kind of strange that he's got the cellos marked piano, right? Um, you see, that's something that I would probably balance differently as a conductor. I would want the cellos to be stronger there. We've got some accompaniment here of the third trombone plus oboes in English horn. That is going to have such a cool sound um, if it's balanced, right? Notice that the marking here only goes up to piano crescendo, whereas the double reeds are <laughs> told to play forte crescendo, right? He really wants this line to stick out, especially since this is Hauptstimme on top, right? And that is being doubled by the first violins. So that's going to come through nice and crisp, and you're going to hear that in the recording. Meanwhile, we've got a little bit more harmony here with the second and fourth horns. Notice how this is organized, right? At this point, Schoenberg wants to put the low horns into one basket and the high horns into another because there's going to be a lot of rolls that are very much easier to score and easier on the conductor's eye. But let's not get uh, hung up with that. Horns the end of that little third trombone of piano crescendo, contrabassoon, and of course the double reeds above. Okay, and while that is supporting the Hauptstimme that we just discussed here, <clears throat> we've got this secondary line right in here, which looks kind of confusing, but it really is just a unison of second violin and violas. You just have to get used to your alto clef reading, right? So it's all the same notes. And I really love the way it arcs like this. This is another place where you would want to make sure that the instruments were balanced, right? Cello's coming in here. This beautiful high note right in here, G at forte in the double basses. But that isn't the Hauptstimme at all, is it? The Hauptstimme has been given off from this G sharp direct here to the first and second clarinet, which are actually playing the same exact pitch, but just inharmonically, right? So uh, B flat, concert sound of A flat, which is the same as G sharp, right? So it's just the same note trading off there. Then I love this beautiful leap up here. And once again, it's all been set up, hasn't it? Schoenberg not only has the Hauptstimme line here with this big motion upwards, he also has this little arc right in here that keeps the rhythmic interest going. And this big leap up here, I feel, also is foreshadowing what is about to happen here in the clarinets. And after the big leap here, we see oboes and English horn take over on that. This is actually a unison, right? Because this A sharp is sounding down a perfect fifth. So unison of three. And notice that the balance here is really towards the winds, with the strings playing the same exact notes, only an octave higher, but pushing into it. So that is a really cool idea, right? Forte crescendo into piano crescendo to forte. And 
there might be something at play here in terms of Schoenberg worrying that the strings might be overwhelming the winds. There is a lot of dynamic marking in this movement that suggests that he had that kind of idea. High clarinets coming back in. I really love this weird line. The jumps down, that's just lovely. And it's the same jump twice, isn't it? All right. We're jumping down from this F all the way down to E, and then same thing again, same ninth jump right there, and ending on this beautiful high C sharp sounding B. Now, picking up from that, we had a B before in the clarinet going to C natural with our Hauptstimme, and then having Hauptstimme include a portamento is such a cool idea. But everything else that is going on in here there is a sense of polyphony and even chorale in the brass at times, but it's all really controlled. Every once in a while you get like some bright color in here, like the second trumpet sort of blasting out a little bit right down there. But I would actually control this as the conductor, and Heitink, the conductor who is conducting the recording we're about to listen to, it does that to a degree. He controls some of the brass right in here. Not quite as much as I would have done, but I'm not a conductor. I mean, I keep saying, well, oh, you know, I would do this or I would do that as a conductor, but I'm not a conductor. So, you know, there are certain decisions to be made about the texture that would be obvious to any orchestrator, but the sense of authority and the sense of knowing your players is a completely different thing. So I'm not judging him at all. Just saying what I would ideally like if I were a conductor, if I could conduct. Then beautiful little lines right in here, all working towards the same exact place right here. What's really, really great is, even with this high note in the first bassoon, the way that it all just eclipses, right? And then there is this rest, which has a lot of power. Right? Sometimes the sound of the silence is very punctuating. But it doesn't last too long. We immediately get this Hauptstimme right in here, molto espressivo in the cellos, diving down here to this low E, and then pushing up. And this is just going to naturally increase in energy. That's one of the lessons that I try to teach in 100 more orchestration tips, and that is how portamento will lose and gain energy depending on which direction the finger is sliding. So as most bass guitarists know, if you slide up with your finger, the string will sound louder and louder or have more projection, right? And the opposite is true when you slide the other direction. Anyways, it's a small point, but it is important with certain types of scoring like this. And as we continue, <laughs> we have tuba takeover finally on the Hauptstimme, and that is such a great idea. But notice how it doesn't last for long, the indication of who is playing Hauptstimme, because as this keeps going, we have the violas in treble clef finally take over, and the Hauptstimme overlaps from place to place and then everything comes to a close. So that is a really good place for us to stop. There is so much more I could say, but a lot of these doublings are pretty obvious, aren't they? Like you've got your octaves here with this beautiful expressive line, espressivo, which is being doubled by the bassoons trading off, first bassoon to second bassoon, and so on, right? So there are some quite obvious doublings and like the same thing horn is helping out and that's a beautiful rich sound but some of it is just really obvious and and so on i mean i like the little interlacing figures here you know those are really really cool and once again they are foreshadowing the activity here of this hauptstimme which comes off as a little weak in the recording it's a place where the Hauptstimme of the tuba is marked so loud that this really isn't going to come through very much, right? But Hauptstimme does not have to be about what is 
the loudest. It is about what is the most important. You hope that it will be the most in the foreground, but it's not always about foreground and background, right? It's just about what is most important. So however you convey that to the listener, all right, as the conductor is your craft. Let's have a listen to these two pages and think about a lot of those things. I'm not going to make a checklist for you here. Just try to remember, if you can't, just jump back to the beginning of where I started to talk about these two screens. Then we'll take a look at the next two screens. Now, picking up on the next page, notice that we have another rest that actually has its own sound, right? We just wrapped up the last phrase. Now our Hauptstimme continues anew with this lovely idea right in here. The cellos, actually forte, crescendo, suddenly piano, subito, and then out and then connecting from this concert G to B flat trumpet which is playing F sharp right uh, a flat written here which would sound G flat but actually would be F sharp to the cellos this is taken up and what's interesting here is that the kind of clangy barking third trombone is going to actually be the thing that the audience hears loudest. And same thing here with the English horn, right? And Sforzando on this written A flat sounding D flat is going to actually be louder than the first trumpet playing its little bit of Hauptstimme in here. But once again, like I mentioned before, Hauptstimme is really about what line is the most important rather than what line is the most in the foreground, right? So. I don't know, that's a bit of a mental twist, but it makes sense in the context of the idea that Schoenberg has here, which is the endless recitative. This is a really cool idea, though. English horn, fourth horn, tuba, and cellos. Playing this little harmonized line in here. Uh, that's just really beautiful. Just those four notes. And you will notice little bits and pieces lifted out of this in concert music, and all the more so as we keep going. This is a little bit that I could imagine being taken right out of this and thrown into a film of the 40s or 50s. This is really lovely in here though, this bass clarinet melody crossing into the bass clarinet's throat tones, right? That just has a wonderful sound. The lower clarino into the throat tones of the bass clarinet. An area that doesn't get scored a lot for bass clarinet, especially in solos, but here is one and you can see how effective it is, especially when you've got this little bit of a push coming from below, from tuba, fourth horn, and lower strings. All right, and from this point, things start to get very, very cluttered or decorated, however you want to look at it. We've got Hauptstimme markings in first and second trombones, right, A2, and we've also got the same pitches in our cellos and the same thing in our English horn. And that is a wonderfully sonorous, pungent kind of mixture, especially when you add in the second clarinet, right? So all those three voices together 
just have such beautiful impact and they really soar all the way up there to B above middle C for the cellos and the trombones and then of course transposing pitches for the English horn and clarinet that's not so high of a note but it still just has this wonderful quality especially with the crescendo in the middle and from there the Hauptstimme line is taken over here by the first trumpet having that wonderful line in there which is doubled by a ton of other instruments two clarinets and both oboes right and then the winds continue on with the Hauptstimme with this hugely solid unison it looks like these instruments are sort of arbitrarily playing wherever and maybe playing transposed octaves but they're all on the same pitch right so we've got our first and second flute and oboes and they are playing the notes as heard in concert pitch and then here this English horn sounding down a fifth it's the same notes and the E flat clarinet sounding up a minor third once again same pitches and even though you don't see the Hauptstimme marking here it's just carried on in the clarinets right just really leaping up to that beautiful high written G sharp so <laughs> it's funny this comes and goes so quickly and kind of compared to the building texture around it it can kind of just be over so quickly that you don't really notice it in fact you might actually notice the first and second violins picking up from that same concert D sharp right you might notice that a lot more than you notice just this little blip here of color but it's still a wonderfully powerful blip I love the way things trade off too we get to this high G sharp and then it's taken over by our clarinets including the piccolo clarinet with this swoop downwards and some flutes right and then before we get into some more stuff we've got Hauptstimme starting here in the double reeds let's jump back a little bit and talk about some of the supporting characters I really love this right down here the triplet measured tremolo here that's how to notate it by the way you've got the three dots over there plus the three on top and then you can just continue on with the three dots and the tremolo beam and that will give you what you need this continuing on the violas and the double basses in unison uh, is just a, a beautiful combination it has a wonderful color to it though I'm not sure how much of that color you can really hear with everything else going on right it's almost like there's just so much stuff in here that you can't really make out any individual bit and there are beautiful little lines that are just thrown in there like this solo violin here which you can sort of hear but it doesn't really call attention to itself because of all the other things happening this is really cool this low bass clarinet line I I think it's just wonderful and you can actually pick this one out as you go through the uh, passage right in here bassoons are pretty cool but what's really going to take your attention here is the fast pizzicato lines here being doubled by staccato flutes that is going to come through really beautifully and then of course these little lines being traded off by the E flat clarinet and the first clarinet just kind of back and forth so that all kind of comes to a head right in here the way that we described it the Hauptstimme line right in here and this push upwards as the low double reeds the bassoon family joins up with the bass clarinet that is really really cool and of course the double basses coming in and helping out with that as well and the uh, the stuff that's going on in here with the strings that all has its own individuality as well 
And once again, just tons of stuff happening in here. The second trumpet doubling the second violins. And this line emerging here is going to actually distract once again from the Hauptstimme. Remember how I was saying this kind of is a blip that just comes and goes? Well, that's because the third trombone and tuba is going to be distracting attention away from everything else going on, because this is going to sound very powerful. That's a very pungent combination, especially right in that particular higher register for the tuba and the bass trombone. Okay, so I've set up the end of this. Let's once again take on another screen. And in fact, after these two screens, I'm going to do three screens in a row because we've got to get through this. Okay, you see this big push in here, our Hauptstimme up here. And once again, this is a triple unison of all of our oboe family instruments, just pushing on that C sharp right in there. And that is going to come through. Then leading after this little F sharp, written F sharp sounding B, leading onwards with the oboe, and this is going to come through really nicely, this first oboe right in here. Because notice the texture is backing off almost immediately. Even though we've got this tuba continuing to sort of twitter along here, and that's got a little bit of horn and middle strings to support it from above. But that's all that's going on. Aside from this push on the downbeat, this oboe is just going to come through really nicely because it's well supported. Then another push here. And the Hauptstimme is taken over by bass clarinet very, very beautifully, doubling with English horn. This is also an idea that Holst played with, doubling English horn and bass clarinet. And it just has a really beautiful sound. Although, don't make that your life's ambition. There are plenty of other really great combinations. But the glue here is really in the supporting parts. The way that the second clarinet walks down and then the tuba and horn sort of walk up. By the way, second clarinet doubled by cellos, I should have mentioned. Okay, so this Hauptstimme is gonna come through really nicely if the conductor is balancing everybody. It's just, once again, triple unison, this time of the upper strings. And then we've got our lower horns. Schoenberg is still dividing things as one and three and two and four, just for the convenience of reading it for the conductor. And these lines in here are going to distract a little bit, but they are actually setting things up for the big push right in here, and then the gentle letdown. Okay, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Hauptstimme jumps to the E-flat clarinet here, and if the E-flat clarinetist is really paying attention to their dynamics, they are going to disappear. I feel this really should be mezzo forte on this entrance, even though Hauptstimme, as I said before, does not have to be the foreground element all the time. It just is really going to get stomped by the first horn right in here. And that's what Schoenberg wanted, but I still feel whatever his calculation was, this doesn't really balance enough for me as a listener. So I would want this to be a little bit more pungent. You start to hear it towards the end, but it doesn't really trade off to that note as nicely as it could have going from C sharp to written C sounding E, right? So it's just up a third. Okay, be that as it may, the trade-off to the clarinets here for this Hauptstimme line, plus the second violins and the violas, which come in, right, to support the uh, piccolo clarinet. So the trade-off to this, you are going to hear very, very nicely. And in fact, as the texture gets more and more complex and more and more things add to it, which I'll talk about in a minute, Schoenberg bulks up the Hauptstimme line. So he adds the E-flat clarinet to it to help out. And then he adds the first oboe. <laughs> and then he piles the three clarinets on top so that that continues on, plus the first violins. And so you really hear that shrieking up 
to this high A and it just sounds terrific especially with the E flat clarinet doubling that really is going to have some pungency okay so before I jump into this next little page here let's talk about all of the things that are supporting that right we got the cellos Divisi and then unison I really love this little line right in here descending it's it's easy to miss but it's there uh, and then these leaps here in the, in the double basses they sound really really cool too and a lot of this stuff is being doubled in the brass right we've got the trombones muted doubling those cellos and then we've got the fourth horn once again doubling the double basses which I think is just nice so nice with just a little touch here and there from of support from other notes like say the second bassoon and the bass clarinet okay then this is just wild I really love this right in here so we've got the rare tenor clef double bass and then going back to a bass clef we have this pizzicato line right in here right and that is doubled by like practically everybody else okay except for this right in here which I'll talk about in a second okay so pizzicato double basses okay we got the same thing in here interesting pizzicato having that sort of pointy feeling to it but we have legato with the other instruments instead of staccato so contrabassoon doing its little part then we've got the second bassoons doubling at pitch the double basses and the contra bassoon until it gets to be too low right once it jumps down to this low a here it has got to go up the octave and it joins up with the bassoon and bass clarinet which are basically playing an octave higher than the other lower instruments right so it all comes together here and then really solid on this low e which is just a devastating note that is so cool and at that point it is joined by the lower heavy brass and is just fat is you know I'd like to use profanity here to say how fat it is but yeah it's just a wonderfully solid note all right meanwhile um, we have this line right in here third trumpets descending right and then that's joined up eventually by the first trombone and yeah it's just really a cool sort of center line moving downwards and it's got no need to be doubled by anybody else there are lots of little bits of polyphony right in here so those horns right in there and we've got the second oboe and English horn and so on so that really leads to this monumental last chord and then here once again I have heard this imitated by many many film scores and you may recognize some of those places and this is like raindrop music like a sudden flurry of raindrops not fierce necessarily you know not like a really howling gale but just like just coming down very very quickly and it might even be gentle but it still is sort of surprising and chilly and pointy maybe like light hail or something like that but just not necessarily having a lot of force because it's so soft but definitely a lot of energy and it's a great use of celesta just wonderful and then little bits of harp playing what notes that can possibly be played without having to change the pedals too much although some of this is going to require a lot of pedal changes towards the end okay uh -huh. it would be nice to sort of see a marked harp part for this entire suite of pieces to see just what the harpist had to do and this is one place where I feel that you'll actually be able to hear the harpist right it isn't just wasted notes but this is all just beautifully done uh, sul ponticello doubling pizzicato such a great idea doubling flutter tonguing in the flutes what a great idea that is and then around that we've got sul ponticello plus pizzicato in all the other instruments descending downwards right so the first and second violins 
the violas and the cellos, all of this being doubled by the harps and celesta, right? Just uh, as they work their way down through these little bits and pieces and fragments. It's really wonderfully effective. And of course, bassoons come in and they are helping out the cellos. So this is all just so cool. <laughs> then adding to that, we've got this very beautiful legato, very noble kind of sounding second trumpet right in here and first trombone, this little clarinet doubling of what's going on in the flutes. It's just really wonderfully done. So I would think that any section of these screens could just be, um, you know, you could just replay them and check out what the quality of sound is. Schoenberg is a bit of an not unstable, but um, uncertain orchestrator in a few places. I feel there are some things that don't quite balance, that kind of have to be adjusted a little bit. Maybe some of the dynamics are not quite exactly where they would work with today's instruments or today's kinds of conducting. And some things just maybe need a little bit more help. And I think that you'll find conductors do adjust certain things and double certain things to make certain lines come out better. Okay. But he's also a masterful orchestrator for all that. And this is one of those passages, once again, like has been imitated by everybody. This has been in so many different movies. And yeah, it's, it's just an indication of his wonderful ability, his wonderful ear. So it doesn't really matter so much what harmonic language he's using on the one hand, because he's just coming up with these great textures. But on the other hand, he might not have been able to come up with some of these textures without the liberation from that harmonic language. And I'm saying that with the deepest amount of respect as somebody who is really a tonalist composer. So it is not necessarily my specialty or my special ability to compose in this style, though I probably could if you needed me to. And I do throw in passages that are atonal or that have some similarity to this from time to time. But admittedly, this isn't really where I focus my musical style, and yet I really respect what he's able to do here. So with that, let's have a listen to these two screens, and then we will take on a monumental three screens in just a minute. Alright, so now for a three-page overview, but I promise this will go fairly fast. Here we've got a unison of oboe, English horn, <laughs> and our first two bassoons. Really pungent, I feel, but if the players control it, it's not too honky. A little bit of support from the third trombone and first horn. And this is going to stand out really lovely, the uh, cellos and violas. Immediately, the first trombone takes over with, once again, a little bit of support from the other brass instruments and some strings here. But what really is cool, I feel, is this bass clarinet line. Once again, lower clarino register going a little bit into the throat tones there on that B. That is just a really wonderful sound, and it stands out beautifully. 
and it's very easy to hear against the other elements, especially if the conductor is making sure to balance right in here. I feel that the double basses can come out a little bit without any damage to the bass clarinet solo. From there, we get into this line here, A sharp up to A, and then F, and then that is picked up a bar later by the bassoons, and this really reminds me of Ives' unanswered question. You know, bum, 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 bum. It has a certain similarity of angularity and atonal sense to it, doesn't it? That is being supported from below by this lovely little harmony right in here. The third trombone on the bottom, and then we've got the middle strings and lower strings, and this lovely high-reaching B-flat. So that is B-flat below middle C, so it's the highest voice in this harmony. And it has a wonderfully creepy sound, I feel. Just really, really great. Great ideas. That continues on with a little bit of support from Contrabassoon coming in there, along with the tuba. And this leap up here, piano crescendo, piano pianissimo subito, and that is doubling the bassoons right in there. And there's a little bit of poco crescendo on that last note with the other instruments leading immediately to the Hapshima continuing on in bassoons with this rip downwards. And, I mean, it's done as a chromatic glissando, usually, or just falling off a little bit through whatever fingerings are convenient for the bassoonist. Because that's a long ways to go in a slightly awkward register, but still pretty easy to play. Here we get into some interesting accompaniment. It looks like unisons, but it really isn't. We've got written B-flat in the clarinets, sounding A-flat or G-sharp, and that is up a minor ninth from this harp right in here. Right, So it's not the same notes at all. It's not doubling. And the same thing goes for here. This is B sounding down a major ninth, which would be the same note as this note here but it's not the same note as these violas on C-sharp, right? So they're playing thirds, kind of like we see thirds here emerging. So very interesting, cool combinations, though, right, of harp, violas, and clarinet and bass clarinet. It's just a wonderfully cool sound in terms of orchestral color. Going on, we got a little bit of Hauptstimme right in here just kind of keeping up the pacing. And there's a missing Hauptstimme mark right here. That might be me or that might be the copyist. But continuing on with second horn right in here in bass clef, right? Don't forget that these were really low notes, but still they're in old notation. So they're sounding up a fourth from the written pitches. So for instance, this would be F sharp written sounding B below middle C. Then Hauptstimme kind of takes over right here. Tutti cellos playing this really cool little line right in here. Ending up fairly high up here on this A and G sharp. And while that's playing, uh, you hear other voices starting to emerge from the texture. The bass clarinet right in here, that's going to stick out pretty well and you'll hear some contrary motion and some parallel motion. But by the time you get to right here, this line right in here, this mezzo forte E flat clarinet diving down right in here, is really going to distract from the first oboe taking over the Hauptstimme. There's just no avoiding it, right? But at least there isn't a huge thick orchestration happening right here at the same time. Okay, but this will become more and more prominent. Piano espressivo, and you'll start to see the way that it's coalescing. The flute's coming in here, doubled by the clarinets, with this Hauptstimme line, then adding the oboes. That is going to cut through really beautifully. 
and this won't distract right in here English horn plus clarinet that's actually a fairly common combination and it works fine and then of course these little lines right in here bassoons and bass clarinet and these lower and middle strings none of that is going to distract at all even right in here when the second violins are playing piano against the lower winds and first horn second trumpet that is still going to stay in the background while the second violins start their little Hauptstimmel line right in here which leads to this uh, wonderful opening out of the orchestra and from this point it's really easy to pick out the Hauptstimmel lines with your ear the second violins don't really have any doubling till they get to this bar in which case the flutes jump in a two and then the E flat clarinet by the next bar and then we just hear this big beautiful shrieking line way up here and that is added to by the flutes and then the piccolo and the first oboe playing octaves below and that is of course being doubled by the violas and as it all just comes crashing to this point we have a beautiful Schoenberg moment right okay well there are so many other things that go into this I'm just gonna touch on it really briefly because I think it's really obvious you can see very very clearly the lower winds right in here and how they are joined by the lower strings finally and everything kind of coalesces together and you can see just little bits and pieces of lines that add to the texture just cumulatively and in a polyphonic way the way the brass kind of comes in there and the way it has this beautiful kind of middle voice counter melody uh, I especially love these little triplets ba -ba -ba -bum, and just really lands solidly on this triple F and this is designed so well that everybody can be playing what they think is triple F and the chord will balance right so here's an example of really really great orchestration the really canny calculations of how this will all balance because we've got our lower strings lower winds low brass which came in there to double the lower strings and of course the harp is just really not going to be heard so those elements are not going to drown each other out and then of course you have these shrieking high notes English horn here of course is going to be doubling the trumpet and that's probably not going to be heard very loudly but for the most part the elements are going to sound just really perfect and once again <laughs> this kind of stuff not this exact moment because I don't think anybody would be quite that brave but this kind of cumulative contrapuntal scoring has really been something imitated in film music people emulating this moment I have heard a lot in scores from the 40s and 50s all the way up to today so that's as much as I'm going to get into for this once again you can really look at some of these things yourself in more detail like the way that the oboes are combining with piccolo clarinet and two clarinets working together now there are just so many cool things about this and how that relates to what's going on in the horns really it's the texture and the balance as much as the functions that interest me so I don't want to get into too many of the functions except for how they relate to the texture really because that's my specialty in these kinds of lectures so let's flip back a couple of screens and see it I told you that wasn't gonna to take too long we will listen to this all the way through and then we'll take a look at the last two screens and bring our series of lectures on Schoenberg's five pieces for orchestra to an end
now for the last section of this piece, if you can really divide it up into sections. It really is one long continuous melody, isn't it? But in this case, it's pretty well defined by this kind of gasp, right? <laughs> like the music came to this big crashing chord and then <gasps> pow! And here we have a, another situation where the Hauptstimme is incredible, but the stuff that's around it is just as exciting and maybe even kind of more interesting, I feel. You can see it very, very clearly scored out here with the uh, first and second violins, right? We've got this uh, ottava here, and in this case, I would say, you know, as a ottava hater for violins and flutes and so on, I would give it a pass right in here because just, you know, that is some really high scoring up there, all the way up to F sharp, the top F sharp on the piano keyboard, right? So that really does get to be a little high. What I would probably do though is just mark the F sharp as ottava in the parts and then the rest of it, the D sharp and so on, everything below that. You know, maybe it's just easier for the player to read if it's all one line. So probably just leave it as that, but you know, a purist could possibly just um, save the ottava for the F sharps, but that's a little too fussy. It's probably better just to have it all the way through if you're really going to be getting into that top octave. Okay, but that doesn't really matter for the piccolo. Just adding a two piccolos to that top line is going to make it cut through anything, just like a knife. And then of course the flutes are taking a kind of a combination part, aren't they? Like they are playing the same notes as the piccolo in the middle, but they're playing the octave on other places where they can't reach. Getting the octave where it's convenient and then doubling at pitch where it can. Then, of course, the other instruments that are able to contribute. We've got clarinet taking the same pitches as the second violin and the E-flat clarinet playing the same pitches as the flute. All right, so that is all going to work out fine. What I really am interested in here is this terrific brass chorale. It is just so interesting. You know, bells up with our horns and it's not really marked in the score, but you would probably want to go back to normal by the pianissimo. It's just kind of a given that once you hit a softer dynamic, the position of the horn is going to uh, go back to normal. And really, really high pitches right in here for both horns, really climbing way up there. And some nice high pitches for the trumpets as well, right? Going up to a written B. Even with a B flat trumpet, that's still pretty screaming. And triple F. <laughs> I like the fact that um, Schoenberg like backs off on the dynamics right here for the heavy brass when he gets to this part, but he still has the lower heavy brass come in, triple F. Okay, well, that's all quite intriguing. Just adding some harmony in here with the strings is good enough, right? And then, um, then some unisons here with these moving lines. The English horn is added because there's nothing else that it can do. The winds are playing these cool little rips, and then that is looking forward, right? Once again, it's foreshadowing, taking over on the Hauptstimme. And this is just a wonderfully arcing line. Clarinets joined by the E-flat clarinet, oboes and flutes diving down. By the time it gets to this F, you're not going to hear the flutes at all, but that's all right. Just might as well have them finish up the phrase. To be joined by the bass clarinet and bassoons, which are going to grab the end of the line with the second violins. And here you'll notice two Hauptstimme lines, right? The second one comes in right here with the first violins, holding this high E, and then eventually ending up 
joining up with the other players. And it really just has become all about the strings right in here towards the end. What's really, really cool is, besides all these little elements here, adding a tiny bit of support here and there, is this little pop here. Piccolos, flutes in octaves, doubled by harp and celesta. And what's cool about this is that the harp is going to be doubling the flutes, right? And the celesta is going to be doubling the piccolos because reading these parts, the celesta player is going to read it and play it an octave higher at their transposing pitch. Now, <laughs> we have once again, some interesting stuff happening. Another little pop here by the flute family and harp and celesta. As this little lower line here brings itself to an end, we've got our Hauptstimme line in first trombone. And that sounds just awesome. Just, I really love this. That's such a Schoenberg kind of a line. And then to have this little push right in here from the wind. That's an awesome idea. And then here we have a kind of confusing notation. It is really the first horn playing below the second horn line here, the second horn playing E flat tied to this and then the B. But the Hauptstimme line right here is A, A sharp, F sharp, and then G, A, F, E, and so on. All right, so that is really the line right in there which is just kind of a continuation of what was happening in the trumpet, in the trombone, and it'll have a similar sound really because of being muted. So it'll kind of ease one into the other. At this point, after a little bit of tuba and lower winds and flute, which is just a really beautiful sound, the cellos come in with the very last little bit of Hauptstimme, right? Even though it ends here, it still essentially continues on because you're going to hear this D sharp nice and strong. So at this point, we have another one of those heavily imitated moments. Some elements are continuing on for the entire four bars, like the tuba and Contrabassoon, which are doubling each other, right? We've got that really, really low G natural. And then here we've got bass clarinet playing F sharp, right? Uh, down a ninth from where it's written. So it forms the interval of a major seventh. And then we have this little push right in here from second trumpet first trombone, which is actually playing above the trumpet, and low oboe and English horn, actually also voice crossing. This is actually G sharp sounding above this C natural. So this chord pushes and then backs off, and then those pitches are taken over. We've got the same C and G sharp, right? taken over by low flutes and uh, clarinet, bassoon. And it's just a really wonderful sound. And actually in the middle, pasting these two together, we have the same pitches from solo strings. So it's just a wonderful crossover from winds and heavy brass to strings to other winds. Just a wonderful change of color right here at the end. And it's similar to what we heard in chord colors, the third movement, but there's something a little bit more eerie about it, I feel, and a little bit more calculated. So that's also been imitated heavily by composers ever since, or maybe emulated would be a better word, or even unconsciously influenced. I'm hearing composers like uh, Johansson and Hildur, who just won an Oscar for the Joker score, a lot of these shifting textures and blending textures really kind of go back to this orchestration, whether it's intentional or not. I will just end with the observation that this was revised and reduced to normal size orchestra September 1949, Arnold Schoenberg, but I don't think it was published until the early 50s. 
but at that point, 12-tone music was becoming in vogue. It was really starting to dominate concert music. There were a lot of new works coming out, serialism and so on, that built on Schoenberg's work, his entire life's work. So it was a really, really good time for him to be revising this so that your average orchestra lineup could play it or attempt it anyway. And maybe he could conduct it. I feel, once again, this is the final thoughts of Schoenberg and is really the best edition to be studying. But it's worth checking out the other one, too, because it has a certain turn-of-the-century charm to it. There's something very similar in feel to, like, the Rite of Spring and Firebird and so on, that sense of kind of epic stretch. And also the score is really interesting to look at visually. And with that, I want to thank you for sticking with me if you've made it all the way to the fifth movement. I'm sure that there are a lot of composers out there. This isn't their cup of tea, but if you were fascinated by the monumental orchestration, just the ingenious solutions that Schoenberg used to face his challenges, then I hope you see that as well along with me, which I just really find this piece a work of genius. And it should stand right there with the Rite of Spring and Daphnis and Chloe and the planets and all the other works that I have analyzed for you, have lectured on for you. And, of course, along with La Mer, which came just before this work by a few years. So please join me for the La Mer lectures, and I will see you soon. And thanks again, especially thanks to my Patreon supporters for supporting this.